We turn now to an American war veteran and former Republican governor who's strong, who has strong words for armed protesters in some of those states who are opposing lockdown measures across the United States. Tom Ridge served in Vietnam and he went on to become America's first Secretary of Homeland Security when the department was formed right after 9-11. And he's been speaking to our Michelle Martin about the need for self-sacrifice and unity in times of crisis. Governor Rich, thank you so much for joining us today. My great pleasure to join you. Thank you. You know, you've got a lot of attention for your an op-ed that you've published in USA Today. Very strong words. Um, you write, the self-absorbed and selfish Americans complain they are irritated, anxious, bored, upset, unhappy that their lives have been affected by this temporary restraint on their freedoms. You're speaking here, of course, about some of the demonstrations that have popped up in state capitals, including your own, where sometimes heavily armed protesters have, you know, screamed at and confronted uh, law enforcement officers trying to sort of maintain control, many not wearing masks. It sounds to me like this kind of uh, was the last straw for you. It was. So what is it that made you want to publish this piece? Well, actually, it began, I decided just to put some thoughts down on paper so that I could uh, a little personal therapy session because it was aggravating the daylights out of me. And I thought, well, maybe I could express the voice of a lot of other Americans. And it was like false bravado. This is a time where self-sacrifice is more important than any time we've had in recent American history. The last time we had major self-sacrifice may have been World War II. We're in a different kind of war right now. It has national implications. And for a bunch of people, who I realize are entitled under the First Amendment to protest and under the Second Amendment to carry arms. But, you know, we don't, if you put them together and walk in and try to intimidate nurses, doctors, and policymakers, we don't do that in this country. We don't make policy at the point of a gun. So I tried to give voice not only to my feelings, but also I think to express the gratitude and the appreciation that we all have for the men and women who try to keep the economy percolating along a little bit but particularly for the healthcare workers that are trying to save us from the scourge. You are speaking here as a, as a veteran, uh, very much so as a veteran, citing your Army service and also thinking about other veterans who have made, you know, the ultimate sacrifice. Um, and you talked about the, your sort of distaste and your um, just taking offense at people confronting people who you say wear a different kind of uniform, you know, nurses and doctors. In some cases, there have been confrontations with healthcare workers who have said it isn't time to reopen the economy because the, the pandemic is still kind of running amok. Well, you know, I think, uh, first of all, one of the thoughts I had when I wrote that is my friend John McCain, and then his friend Albert Alvarez was actually in the Noy Hilton longer than he was. The prisoners war writ large, uh, who, uh, I mean, when you think about there's their containment for months or years at a time. Now, the protesters could go home, they got the refrigerator, they got the TV, they got the internet, they got some things they can do, they can walk outside, put a mask on, and somehow their life has been momentarily disrupted. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of people out there under tremendous economic stress. I don't think that's what got these folks there. It's that whole notion that we're gonna, this false bravado in the in confronting a time when self-sacrifice is so important. And I thought about the men and women who have worn uniforms in harm's way, I'm proud to have worn the, 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 the uniform of this country. And when we understood that we were all in it together, whether it was my little team, my squad in Vietnam, or anybody else been affiliated with any branch of the military, when you're kind of in this space with it, confronted with a challenge, uh, you put aside differences, you collectively come together, you look out for each other because your goal is to get everybody through the through the crisis. And so that whole notion of self-sacrifice and contribution is very much a part of the DNA of all veterans, whether they served in war or peace. That's what they do. And that's why I take that conduct, walking around kind of a macho-like kind of weapon. Uh, you know, that's just, that's not courageous. It's not heroic. And frankly, I found it offensive. And I think most veterans probably did as well. What, what, what do you think is up with the weapons? I don't know. You probably need to get talk to a psychologist uh, to understand why they felt under these circumstances uh, they should uh, walk around with a weapon of war at their side in a democracy uh, and uh, confronting 
policymakers, and there were earlier confrontations with nurses and doctors. And I'm thinking, these are the men and women in this country trying to save lives. And somehow, whatever, whatever brings you to confront them, you're getting in the way. They are the first line of defense. They're the tip of the spear. And I, when I looked at them and I said, now, wait a minute, why don't you put those down, put a mask on, put the garb on, and then go into a hospital full of uh, coronavirus patients, and let me see how tough you are under those circumstances. Your piece is very much directed toward the protesters, but I can see, you know, one name that's missing here is Donald Trump's. I mean, do you, I mean, the president is in some ways encouraging this, and well, I found it interesting that you didn't speak about it in, in, in any real way. Why is that? Well, everybody knows that my, my personal feelings, as I take a look at his brand of leadership, it's not consistent with mine. I found that the notion that somehow he called on Americans to liberate the economy or liberate something, it's a, again, it's a, a, a fall. I mean, I, I don't quite understand the psychology around that. And my, my point of view at this time was to uh, ignore the president and his style of leadership and what he says, just focus on those protesters and whether or not they'd have to answer the question whether or not they responded to his, uh, what some people thought was encouragement. Uh, I don't think this group necessarily needed encouragement, but when the president said, uh, there are really some good people, there's nice people there, it reminded me of Charlottesville. And I don't know any anybody that's a racist or bigot who walks around trying to intimidate other people. I don't quite, we have a definition of what's nice or good people. So the president and I probably differ on how, how you characterize uh, people's actions, that's for sure. Do you think these people are scared in a way? They're frightened and maybe this is the way they express their fear. Well, I would want to give them the benefit of a doubt because the anxiety around generated through the uncertainty, the uncertainty of what tomorrow will bring, the uncertainty of whether my job will be there. I didn't get a sense that they were there because of the economic uncertainty. I got a sense there they were trying to you know, assert themselves in some fashion that I just can't rationalize, can't think how anybody conclude that that assertion in a very physical, offensive, aggressive way was going to help that community, that state, or this country solve the problem and win the battle against COVID-19. I mean, the president said he wants to be viewed as a wartime president. Well, you know, the enemy is Mother Nature, and it's COVID-19. And we need not remind ourselves there were three or four presidents since the beginning of the 60s that had to confront the horrors of Vietnam. And already in this war, we've lost more, there are more fatalities than there were for our time and engagement in, in uh, Vietnam. This is a self-sacrificing time. We're seeing most Americans adjust. Don't get me wrong, a lot of anxiety. People want to go back to work. People at the margins. Nobody's paying attention to these folks. Can you imagine, I can just see it and close my eyes, and walk through some communities in Pennsylvania, where I know they're, they're not depressed communities, but their families are hard scrabble. They're working hard. They may have a job or two, minimum wage, slightly above, a couple of kids. They're cramped into space. Now, all of a sudden, their income's gone. What's tomorrow bring for them? They have anxieties. They're real. They're social. They're personal. They're economic. We feel for them. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of those people were involved in the protests. You know, I understand that you say that you know, your views about President Trump are, are known and that you, you're not sure that these protesters were necessarily taking their cues from him. I mean, there were a lot of Trump hats at this rally and his signature, you know, paraphernalia at this rally. Um, you are one of the lions of the Republican Party. You are not just, a, you know, your former governor. You are the first head of the Department of Homeland Security. Where's the rest of your posse? Where's the rest of your crew? Where are the rest of the people who have served as you have served? And why are we not hearing their voices in the same way? I would defer to my colleagues not to explain it for themselves. I choose not to, I choose to speak for myself. I have to admit to be somewhat disappointed, uh, but uh, I'm not gonna second guess anybody's motives. I'll just publicly express my disappointment. I, I think, look, I think there will be a time and place down the road, it's still going to be a couple months where we can get into the political infighting. And frankly, it's, right now it's going on both sides. But the, the individual that has the bully pulpit, the loudest megaphone, the one that gets all the attention happens to be the president. So, but he's got the megaphone. And what it disappoints me 
is that some of these daily press conferences include some kind of political uh, component. And I just say to my president, he's, he's my president, um, that is not the time for political acrimony. Now is the time to advance collective self-interest, collective cooperation, federal, state, Republican, Democrat, black, white, Asian. We're in this together. And everybody is red, white, and blue. So let's put the partisan politics aside. Um, don't use those opportunities. Do anything. Again, it's a contrast in styles. If you were still serving as a governor right now, what are some of the things that you would do? I mean, the fact is, as you've noted, many people are really suffering right now. I mean, the lines, you see the lines for the food banks are miles long. Um, what would you do right now? Well, I think uh, you've hit, first thing you look at is for those that are most vulnerable, not only from disease, but from the deprivations caused by a lot of fact, a lot of people aren't working. Kids aren't going to school, a lot of people aren't working. So you got to make sure the basic human needs are met. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you, you have to bring in uh, your scientists and your doctors. You're allowed to do this based on information you have about one of our counties or regions in Pennsylvania. And I think I would, uh, again, based on that information, you begin to uh, deal with some of the anxiety and the unrest uh, socially and financially by laying out an incremental plan, uh, assuring Pennsylvanians, one, you understand and appreciate the stresses that they're under, and there are way, there's a way ahead. And so I think, uh, you know, if I were governor, actually there from time to time, as I look at the 50 governors, I think by and large they're doing a great job, in spite of the fact they get a little mixed signals from D.C. from time to time. I think you just have to be reassuring, be confident, but lay out a pathway ahead, but do understand every time that you have an opportunity to talk to your citizens, you understand the strain that they're under, and these are the things you're trying to do to finally eliminate some of that uh, anxiety and get them back to work. Are you at all concerned about the effect of this pandemic on election security? Primaries are going on. A number of states have had to, or have made the decision to delay. Are you concerned about that at all? No, actually, I've got a probably a, a not a contrarian point of view, but a very a different perspective. Uh, I have often been very disappointed when I see voter turnout. Mm -hmm. Local elections, primaries, 20 percent, 30 percent. I I happen to think that voting isn't a privilege. I think it's a responsibility of citizenship. That's mm -hmm. my point of view. Now, there's no need to postpone the elections, but I'd like to think that now is the time for people to understand if you can't get to the polls, it's very easy to select among leadership choices by simply requesting an absentee ballot. And if nothing else, I'd like to think that as you look to the November election primarily, that people were still reluctant to go to the polls, that all 50 governors in all these states and the local, local mm -hmm. election boroughs will encourage people, register, 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 and vote absentee. It's a long overdue. I'd love to see 80 or 90 percent participation. And what an, what an irony it would be that because of the COVID pandemic that people finally understood. I can vote absentee and I need to vote absentee. And uh, I hope it happens that way. Before we let you go, I'm going to ask you to put your Department of Homeland Security hat uh, back on if indeed you've ever taken it off um what should be happening now what are some things that you think should be taking place now to try to c address this ongoing pandemic and frankly prepare for the next one because all of our intelligence um experts are saying that this is not the last well i think it's a wonderful question because uh, while well, we've always focused for the past decade or two on the globalization of transportation and globalization of finance and globalization of communication, this uh, tragically becomes exhibit A for the globalization of disease. And uh, for what we need to understand now is that this certainly won't be the first time, and this may not be the worst epidemic that we're confronted with. Mm -hmm. So. You know, about six years ago, I started working with my good friend, Senator Joe Lieberman, mm -hmm. the bipartisan panel on biodefense. And we saw back there gaps and vulnerabilities just given the way the federal government is structured. 
we could anticipate that it would not be able to confront a pandemic like this. So we made a series of recommendations. Now, some are right, some are wrong. It's immature what we said then, but as we work our way through this, we've got to go back to that and say to ourselves, okay, what do we need to do together, Republicans and Democrats, in a way to make sure that we reduce the risk? Because you're never going to eliminate this virus, and you're never going to eliminate these pandemics. But well, how do we reduce the risk that the impact, the social, economic, and more tragically, the personal impact is substantially reduced now that we know that disease is global like everything else? There's a way ahead once we get through this. But for the time being, it's self-sacrifice. It's what men and women in uniform of this country have been doing for a long, long time, looking out for each other. If we look at America's history, when we're together, we're resilient. And we're resilient, we succeed. And normally, once we've gone through a crisis, we become a better and stronger country. That's what we could do here, but it's about self-sacrifice. Governor Ridge, uh, the former governor of Pennsylvania, the first secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, governor, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for speaking with us Pleasure today. To you. Thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you.